I think you can see my slides. Is that right? Yes. Good morning, Dr. Chung. Um, it looks beautiful. It's perfect. Okay. Great. I'll stop sharing then. Okay.
Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Reza Hagigi. I'm the founding director of the International Center for Genetic Disease and an assistant professor of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 10th lecture of the Harvard Genome Series on Genomic Medicine. Today's lecture will be delivered by Dr. Wendy Chong, incoming chief of the Department of Pediatrics of Boston Children's Hospital. Today, we have around 500 participants from 35 countries on Zoom and YouTube. Please feel free to tweet about this event using hashtags ICGD or Genomics Keynote. This series is organized by the International Center for Genetic Disease, or ICGD. ICGD aims to enhance genomic medicine and focuses on the analysis of populations from different parts of the world for genetic research into human health and disease with the ultimate goal of improving public health. Our goal is to improve access to genomics for everyone, not only for the rich or the lucky. ICGD has been formed by Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, in partnership with other Harvard affiliated institutions, including Mass General Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard School of Dental Medicine, and the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. We are delighted to have a distinguished board from all these institutions. In this series, we feature talks by globally renowned scientists as they explore the very foundations of life and improve our understanding of genetics, biology, and health. Today, I'm delighted to host Dr. Wendy Chong, who is a renowned geneticist known for extensive work in human genetics and pediatrics. As of July 1st, in less than 10 days, Dr. Chong will be assuming her new roles at the, as the chief of the Department of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital, the Mary Ellen Avery Professor of, at Harvard Medical School, and the president of the Children's Hospital Pediatric Associates. Wendy is joining us at Harvard from the Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, New York Presbyterian Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, there, she served as the chief of the, the division of clinical genetics and Kennedy family professor of pediatrics and medicine. Dr. Chong was the recipient of the American Academy of Pediatrics Young Investigator Award, the Medical Achievement Award from Bonne Olam, the New York Academy Medal for Distinguished Contributions in Biomedical Sciences, and the Rare Impact Award from the National Organization of Rare Disorders. Dr. Chong is renowned for her teaching and mentoring and received Columbia University's highest teaching award, the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching. Wendy is the PI of Guardian, a research study that screens newborn for over 250 genetic conditions not currently screened as part of standard newborn screening. <clears throat> She was the original plaintiff in the Supreme Court case that overturned the ability uh, to patent genes and served on the Institute of Medicine Committee on Genetic Testing. It's an honor to introduce Dr. Wendy Chong to you as today's keynote speaker at our ICGD Genomic Medicine Lecture Series. Wendy's lecture will be 30 minutes and we will then open the session for questions. Wendy, we are thrilled to have you um, uh, here in Boston. And thank you once again for accepting my invitation. Uh, and this stage is now yours. Thank you. I'm thrilled to join you. And with this, I will say that I'm going to give a broad overview of many things and I'll go quickly um, to leave plenty of time for discussion, uh, but uh, apologize in advance for the brevity. So I do think a lot these days about how can we scale what we're doing. We've learned a lot of lessons as a community, and I think we now have an opportunity to accelerate what we're doing by making sure that we leave no one behind and that we're equitable in terms of being able to bring genomic medicine uh, to many more people. Um, my disclosures. Um, and as I talk about this, I'm going to use a few use cases by example. Uh, many of you know that I work on autism and it's quite a diverse condition. And there are many co-occurring conditions. And especially when we think about young children, it's not always clear what the trajectory will be long-term. 
And it really is not a single condition, it's really autisms. Uh, and as we think about this, it's incredibly important to tailor our care and our prognosis based on that information. So realizing that heterogeneity and how common it is and uh, what the impact is on so many people, I realized, uh, as did many others, that we needed to have some greater homogeneity. We needed that for replication, reproducibility of studies. We needed it to understand the fundamental biology of the brain and behavior, and we needed to have uh, larger cohorts to be able to study those multiple dimensions. One, it's only one, but one way of reducing some of that dimensionality is through genetics and genomics. And previous studies, uh, including, for instance, the Simon Simplex collection, a really foundational study, were far too small with only 2,500 people. And so we needed to be able to do something much larger. So approximately eight years ago, I began planning what has now become uh, the largest autism cohort, that of Spark or Simon's Foundation Powering Autism Research for Knowledge. Um, I'll give this by example and simply say that I think this is one way we can start to scale, and it's not only autism, but really thinking about many, many common conditions, especially those affecting children. Um, with this, uh, we, number one, spent quite a bit of time with planning, and number two, have individuals with autism who are integrated in every part of what we do, and I think that's a real, been a real key to our success. In doing this, it's also important to me that this is a reciprocal interchange, that we continue learning together. And as we do this, we've taken every opportunity we can in Spark to do that, to do that responsibly, and to evolve that. Uh, and these are at the level of individual results, as well as at the level of group uh, information that we're learning. I also believe very much in data sharing, uh, responsible data sharing, keeping individuals' information private, yet being able to use this in the broadest way possible. And so all of those principles have really driven um, many of the studies that I'm going to show you about today. Um, as we've done this in Spark, as you'll see, one of the dimensions has been, uh, again, stratification along the genomic dimension. And as we've done that, I've had a, a coexisting, what I think of a sister study to this, that of Simon's searchlight. Um, Spark is defined by a behavioral uh, condition, that is the behavior of autism, whereas searchlight is defined by the genetic diagnosis or the genetic uh, division. And so we take individuals from around the world. Spark is a US cohort, whereas Searchlight is an international cohort with individuals from around the world, some of whom are identified from Spark and some of whom are identified from clinical testing or other research studies. And again, being able to use the power of rare diseases and unification in large part through patient-led groups that are doing that to be able to learn from each other. And within this, as you'll see, we have approximately 200 chapters within Simon Searchlight each of which is a rare either gene or CNV associated uh, in most cases with about 25% of those individuals with autism, all of them associated with some sort of manifestation. Um, getting back to Spark, as we've been doing this, uh, this is a resource that's available and is meant to be a longitudinal journey and understanding individuals over the life course. Um, to give you an example that I'll be showing you, we now have over 130 individuals with autism in this cohort, and it is a living, evolving uh, study, and it is open for researchers through the research match mechanism to be able to use this cohort to understand the questions that they have as well. Um, the defining feature of this is what we call a professional diagnosis of autism. And as we've done uh, verification studies, uh, we find that individuals can accurately self-report that. And we have uh, greater than 99% concordance in that verification study, showing that we really do have uh, an autism cohort. We've done this with a network in the US uh, of what I think of as exceptional clinical care sites, including Boston Children's from its inception, um, who are our partners in terms of moving this forward. This also allows us access to EHR data, uh, things like EEG data, very granular data to be able to enable people to understand these multiple dimensions, not only genomics, but also clinical behavioral phenotypic data. And as I said, understand that evolution over the life course. This just gives you some sense of what the uh, growing cohort has been. It includes individuals with autism, as well as their relatives, um, most commonly their parents, as well as first degree relatives, including siblings with and without autism or other behavioral conditions. And all told that cohort numbers, including the other relatives, over 300, uh, excuse me, 340,000 individuals and still continuing to grow. Not everyone has genomic data, and it's not a requirement that individuals uh, participate within the genomic studies, but go to give you some sense of just uh, how large that cohort has become, and I said, as I said, continuing to grow over time. 
With this, we uh, return results um, shown in the darker blue bars are the results. These are genetic results uh, related to an autism diagnosis, autism or a related neurodevelopmental disorder. And then more recently, we've begun shown in orange bars here, also returning the ACMG secondary findings, um, that of the most impactful and most common ones related to hereditary breast ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome, and familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, within this, this is something I've been very dedicated to from the beginning. We return CLIA certified clinical results with a genetic counselor, a certified genetic counselor, all of which is paid for, covered by Spark Central in terms of doing this, and allows individuals to go along that continued journey from Spark to Searchlight and continue better understanding their own condition and understanding um, each other. As we're doing this, the research, uh, which has been a combination in the genomic space of exome and genome sequencing, again, freely available through Safari Base. Many of you probably know about this resource already. Um, and as we've learned, uh, one of the things that's been amazing to see both in 2022 and into 2023 is the number of researchers around the world who have used those cohorts, uh, mainly for autism research, but also for other neurobehavioral conditions and other medical conditions writ large, and how consistent some of the core findings have been. That replication reproducibility uh, has been a founding, that founding principle has in fact uh, been born to bear uh, to be correct. On the other hand, it's also allowed some creativity um, that allows individuals to do different things with the data. And there's a new paper that will be coming out soon showing, for instance, how even Spark and the UK Biobank can take forward our understanding both of rare and more common conditions as well. One of the things that we and others have seen from this as we've done this is that there's quite a bit of overlap between the genes in SPARC for autism and neurodevelopmental genes, including those that, for instance, uh, increase probability of intellectual disabilities, ADHD, and other behavioral or cognitive issues. We've realized in terms of doing the accounting that uh, in SPARC, we know of approximately two thirds of those genes, largely due to de novo variants um, that are responsible and overlapping for those neurodevelopmental disorders. But we're also appreciating that inherited rare variants are an important driver and contributor in terms of uh, understanding autism. And in fact, our understanding of those inherited rare variants far less sophisticated. We only know of approximately 19% of those genes. That architecture that we're starting to see is, as I said, and, and Mike Taukowski and Jack uh, were among the uh, groups looking at this in very deep ways, um, is that, as I said, much of that overlap, um, and I'll show you this analogy in a second, in terms of those genes that are major contributors, large effect genes, single gene variants that contribute uh, really significantly, many of those genes are the same genes that affect very, very, very early brain development in terms of fetal life and fetal development, and also are the same genes that have really more global effects in terms of brain and cognition and multiple behavioral components. Um, shown here, especially if you look on the right of the panels between the blue and the red bars, are shown in red, um, each of these rows is a gene and shown in the red bar are individuals with de novo variants, uh, but in the blue bars, individuals with variants in those same genes, sometimes the same exact variant in the gene, but that are inherited. And so what you can start to see is this overlap, some genes driven much more by de novo events, other genes driven much more by inherited variants. Um, and as I'll get to some of these genes also with overlapping actually structural congenital anomalies. So it's not only what's above the shoulders, but also what's below the shoulders in terms of uh, development writ large. As we see this, and as we see families associated with this, we're also realizing um, that these same genes and variants are not only related to, for instance, cognition, but also related behavioral conditions, anxiety, schizophrenia, and, um, other attention disorders, ADHD. And so we're starting to understand better the global architecture as we do think about the brain and behavior. The emerging um, model, which um, many of the geneticists will not be surprised to see, is that it's really a contribution, though, of many different contributors. That is uh, genes of strong effect, uh, inherited variants of moderate effect, as well as even polygenic risk or multiple genes with common variants of small effect. But let me also say, and I put this in the analogy of ice cubes and a threshold, uh, for instance, that one must reach of this dotted line to show uh, beyond a threshold a particular manifestation. 
Um, to also realize there is in the background other contributing factors, other things, be they environmental exposures, um, be they, for instance, things that may change over the life course. And that's one of the wonderful things about pediatrics is the development of the child and those things that change in terms of interventions potentially, and especially those interventions in early childhood. And so within this, I think we do have, in some cases, the ability to shape a young child and to be able to uh, with early recognition, and I emphasize that, with early recognition to be able to potentially change trajectories. And I think that's uh, one of the things we hope to do uh, specifically within autism. Um, this is now looking at the parents within SPARC. And again, because we have the ability to study families and as families as contributors, we can start to see some of those uh, blurry lines between other behavioral and uh, manifestations in our parents. And those include as I've said, with those transmitted variants, uh, many other uh, behavioral manifestations, um, those related, one would think, to social behavior and autism, but also related to other behavioral manifestations and realizing um, that there's quite a bit of overlap, not surprising in terms of understanding human biology. To switch gears for a second and go from above the shoulders to below the shoulders, uh, we also study a number of congenital structural anomalies. Um, I'm showing you just one example of congenital heart disease, but to say that the same could be true for, or congenital diaphragmatic hernia rather, but to say the same could be true of congenital heart disease or esophageal atresias or any number of other conditions. That is, there's great complexity. And really uh, what we strive to do is to understand that complexity and to fine tune the care of the individual person. One of the um, great um, sort of mysteries had been for a while in terms of CDH, which is a defect in the diaphragm that during development uh, can oftentimes result in the abdominal contents being moved up into the thorax uh, and actually compressing the lungs and the developing heart such that uh, one had thought that many of the long-term pulmonary manifestations were due to compressive effects. Um, one of the primary questions had been whether or not that hypothesis was in fact true, or let me throw out another hypothesis, whether or not in some cases the underlying uh, reason for the diaphragmatic hernia, especially if it were a gene, might it be that there were pleiotropic effects that would be have primary effects in terms of lung development, such that it was not the secondary compression, but a primary effect in terms of lung development? And just to say that I think it's complicated, and the answer is probably want some children with one, some children with the other, but we now have tools to be able to start dissecting this. And we can do this because as we find some of those genes with diaphragmatic hernias, as we have with autism genes, we can now using mouse models separate these primary from secondary effects. And so for instance, in mouse models uh, that we've uh, made with Jin Sun, for instance, being able to have individuals who have, uh, these are mice now, uh, with defects where we can in a gene, in an organ or cell specific manner, knock out those genes or alter those genes such that we can have an intact diaphragm in some mice, but yet have a primary uh, effect of those gen genetic deficiencies in the lung only see a primary effect in lung development. And in this particular case for a gene called MONP1, which we know now to be the most common genetic contributor of strong effect, both inherited and de novo events in CDH, we can see this primary effect in terms of lung development. And in fact, in doing so and looking back at our clinical cases, realize that this is one of our most severe outcomes in many cases, and, primary, and it is primarily due in people due to this effect that we see on the lung. We can look at this and we can see now across multiple cases uh, that when we have um, looking across genes for CDH, we can see that even in uh, cases that appear to be isolated, that is not multiple anomalies or multiple developmental conditions, genetics now stratifies for us in isolated cases, uh, something as simple as mortality. So even that bit of information now giving us much better prognosis in complex cases helping as well, uh, but the differential is not nearly as striking as it is in isolated and now putting everything together, and that's the key is bringing everything together when we look at neurodevelopmental issues uh, for these children long-term, because again, we have this commitment uh, for our communities to follow them long-term, realizing that there are multiple contributors to long-term outcomes with brain and behavior in our dreams cohort with CDH to realize that, multi, that one of the most important drivers in that is in fact that genetic variant and those pleiotropic effects we see not just on the diaphragm, but also in terms of the brain. And in fact, as we do that and appreciate that, 
we realize that not surprisingly, these worlds come together. And that's one of the things that I think is so important by studying the whole person is that individuals who are looking at this only in isolation, only looking at a diaphragm, only looking at a heart, only looking at the head are missing the big picture. And in fact, we're starting to now understand that architecture of which of those genes, as I'm showing here, sort of don't stay in their lane, but the genes that really go across different types of congenital anomalies with neurodevelopmental disorders. And many of those genes, not surprisingly, expressed very early on in fetal development, expressed very much in terms of either specific cell types that are foundational in terms of organogenesis or more broadly expressed throughout multiple cell types. Um, genes that now we can start to understand some of that prognosis and understand and refine the care of those individuals by what to expect in the future. And again, especially when it comes to some of the things that are still evolving postnatally, potentially to be able to intervene when we know that information early enough. So as I alluded to, we've made these cohorts of searchlight as we've done that with Searchlight, um, one of the things in scalability is to be able to do something once and to rinse and repeat. And we've done that with Searchlight in the sense of now approximately 200 of these conditions, opening these up to individuals from around the world. And these individuals come into Searchlight in part from some of my studies, in part from other uh, clinical diagnoses, but we put the whole person together and understand that. And as we're doing that, really share freely back that information with clinicians, with uh, through individual family meetings, which number uh, now into the hundreds, and being able to have resources, including, for instance, uh, freely available data, uh, induced pluripotential stem cells, uh, other models uh, to be for researchers to be able to study this, but to be able to make this easier and to de-risk this in terms of progress. This is just by the numbers, being able to see these cohorts in the aggregate are getting large, uh, numbering, numbering over 6,000, and some of the individual communities in the hundreds of individuals per gene. Um, we can now start to look across those genetic conditions and realize there's quite a bit of diversity. And so Audrey Tharm at the NIH, who has done this for both SPARC and across the searchlight conditions, for instance, at looking at milestones, one can start to see the heterogeneity. And I'll point out the, the lowest or the bottom row here, PPP2R5D is one of those conditions we've looked at. Um, one of the things we've started to appreciate is that um, you can now start to understand the organization across gene families as well. And so you can start to look at channels as a group. You can understand poor domains and you can see similarities in both structure and function. And in this case, looking now at uh, PPP2R5D, as a member of a phosphatase family, the regulatory subunit of PP2A, one can now start to look across those genes. And in fact, the genes, the mutations that we see, the amino acid residues are in fact missense variants that are affected in the, now that we know the three-dimensional structure of the protein based on cryo-EM, uh, based on the binding site and changing the substrate specificity. And in fact, across that family of genes, we can now see exactly the same residue affected exactly when you line them up and it's exactly the same, in fact, even amino acid substitutions. So we can now start to get insight into even new genes and families and predict where we're going to see uh, particular mutations and be able to help with variant interpretation. With this, and even though we're seeing recurrent missense variants, I'm showing you within this gene four recurrent missense variants and showing you the violin plots in the Vineland behavioral uh, adaptive behavioral scale. Um, on the y-axis, you can see though there's heterogeneity, even though you have homogeneity of a single gene and a single variant. And realizing that, again, there are other things both within the genome and development that are affecting those outcomes with the hope that we can understand, for instance, for the person who's at the top end of the, that violin plot, what's different between that person and the bottom end. And to a certain extent, this is epilepsy, uh, and my hope is that with the recognition of that early on may help us to get to that better trajectory uh, with that early diagnosis. We've realized though, and I wanna freely admit this, that many of our data sets are skewed towards young children. And in fact, when we've had the opportunity to look at individuals now in their 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, we've realized that some of those genes we thought were neurodevelopmental are actually neuromaintenance. And we can start to see if one looks long enough over the life course neurodegeneration in this one gene we now know to be associated with atypical Parkinson's and loss specifically of dopaminergic neurons with the early recognition now of even symptoms starting in the teenage years, but with the ability to treat this uh, with the same medications that we use for Parkinsonism. 
Um, very briefly, uh, there are some conditions that we're trying, uh, following in Tim Yu's footsteps, uh, trying to think about how can we um, now start to do treatments, uh, just dipping our toe in the water. Uh, one condition some of you know I study is KIF-1A associated neurological disorder, uh, associated with quite a range in terms of severity. Um, approximately 24% of those individuals have autism, but importantly, a neurodegenerative condition uh, oftentimes associated even with death within the fir first few years of life. And so uh, not certainly a typical form of autism, a much more severe form. Um, just to give you a visual of this, looking at the cerebellum for this individual just two years apart by MRI, you can see how quickly that neurodegeneration can occur. Uh, looking at the cerebellum and on the right showing at five years of age, being able to see now how much we have those uh, essentially replacement of the cerebellar uh, the location where we had the cerebellum now filled with fluid, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, fundamentally, this gene, uh, this protein rather, is a dimer, a homodimer. And this is a kinesin uh, that's walking along the microtubule. Um, the mutations that we see are almost all missense mutations. Uh, they're in the motor domain or the portions of the foot that you can see walking across the microtubule, making contact with the microtubule and affecting, we now know by looking literally at the biophysical properties of this, affecting anything from the time it spends on the microtubule to locking uh, and going into rigor um, to being able to how it makes contact and, and uh, how processive it is, how, how quickly it can move and how long and how far it moves along the microtubule. Um, with this and understanding this process and knowing that this is a dominant negative in terms of effect, that is these heterozygous mutations are essentially acting as a poison pill. Uh, we knew that the strategy needed to be to get rid of one of those copies, the, the heterozygous mutant copy. Knowing that haploinsufficiency, while not perfect, was a whole lot better uh, than it is in terms of having this dominant negative. And so with uh, collaborators at NLORM uh, began to develop to screen and develop an ASO that would be both uh, to well tolerated, that is safe as well as potentially efficacious and have now dosed uh, in this particular an ASO that is actually targeted not at the mutation but at a polymorphism uh, that is in phase with the mutation and being able to use that uh, with intrathecal administration with one single patient. And, and let me say that it is one single patient. And uh, this is, we're not done with this in terms of understanding the full efficacy. Uh, but I think we have demonstrated in treating not quite a year now, but safety in terms of this and shown each one of these is an outcome measure, some subjective, some objective in terms of looking at the outcomes and shown on the leftmost portion is prior to treatment. And then each of the red lines showing dosages with an increased dose until we got to our safe uh, dose of 60 milligrams and shown that, for instance, with self-reported uh, seizures, the number of seizures, the longest seizure, those first two top lines, you can see how many seizures per day we were having and how dramatically we come down, but also being able to show on that third line, for instance, the spike wave index and going uh, from an EEG with an objective measure and being able to see that come down as well. Um, and this has been true also of spasticity from being uh, really non-ambulatory and wheelchair bound, now being able to be ambulatory, much more independent uh, and improved quality of life with that. In doing this with all of these rare conditions, we thought about how to take those learnings and really drive clinical implementation. And I'm very proud to say that we've uh, worked with the ICD-10 committee. Uh, this was uh, my Don Quixote experiment to see whether or not we could actually get this done, but we have. Uh, with MED13L now has an official ICD-10 code. And in working and educating them, I think we have a sense of how to start now scaling this for rare diseases. We've worked with many groups to be able to take these learnings and to convert these into um, uh, things that we can use in terms of clinical guidelines and care and made this freely available and worked with EPIC and will continue working with EPIC in terms of thinking about how to scale this with dissemination of this information, uh, making sure that this is accessible in a, the manner in the workflow where physicians need this information so that they don't have to come digging. It's really much more of a push than a pull. And in doing so, I have been thinking about how to scale this at population health. And uh, in the last couple minutes to say that I started this uh, for my own personal journey way back when, when I started studying PKU, even as an undergraduate, 
um, but then really trying to change what we're doing in terms of implementation science with many collaborators at the New York State Department of Health. And this is old news, uh, but did this uh, in 2016 for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, just to prove that we've done this, we, uh, with that collaboration, got on the recommended universal screening panel. And now uh, this is done throughout the United States and many places in the world. And we now have three FDA approved medications for what used to be, past tense, used to be the most common genetic cause of death for children less than two years of age. And now in many cases to have a one and done treatment for those children, especially with type one SMA. So truly transformational. And we want to think about how to do that uh, now it, with other conditions. Uh, since then, we've done um, similarly done pilot studies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And uh, given my inpatient self, uh, wanted to think about how we could leave no child behind and how we could do this at larger scale. And so we've launched uh, Guardian, which is now thinking about doing this and having to bring in new technology to achieve newborn screening for many more treatable conditions and making sure that we did it uh, in a hard way um, that is doing it with the public health system, trying to make sure that there just is a system where it just happens and where every chance has that equal chance to a healthy start to life. As we've done this, this Guardian study, uh, which stands for genomic uniform screening against rare diseases in all newborns, um, we took six, uh, four years rather of planning, starting with our families involved in SMA and DMD newborn screening and, and really started thinking hard about what should be on that panel. Um, they gave us a lot of feedback. This should be conditions that are early onset, children less than five years of age. We should be sure of these conditions. Uh, we should not be returning variants of uncertain significance, but we should be equitable. We should make sure that in a community like New York City that has the diversity that we have, that we were not just offering results because of our limitations of variant interpretation to individuals whose genomes we understood, that is individuals of European ancestry, we needed to consider the world diversity that we have in New York City and strike this very, very hard balance. I will tell you, it's a day-to-day -day struggle with me uh, for sensitivity and specificity. Um, and so we're trying to think about how to do this responsibly and how to make sure our errors in either direction are not too great and do this with full transparency. Um, in doing this, we want this to eventually be what we would do with public health, that is returning this information within a few days, but we're not there yet. And we really truly understand that this is an iterative process. So we gave ourselves a few weeks and I'm, I'm glad to say that we have uh, met those timelines. As we did this, we heard from parents, um, though that we there were things that were completely treatable today, but we also needed to think about the tomorrows. And I've highlighted this a little bit in what I've said that is that we do, I truly believe, have the ability with early diagnosis to change the trajectory for children uh, with some neurogenetic conditions uh, by early recognition of epilepsy, by early recognition of some of those challenges and helping them early on while the brain is still plastic. And so uh, not all parents agreed, but based on that feedback, uh, we do offer what I think of as an optional group of conditions um, that are really neurogenetic conditions, many of which are associated with epilepsy and where we do think we can have early intervention impact. So as we've done this, uh, we decided to do this as whole genome sequencing from the newborn screening dried blood spot um, for the workflow that we have uh, with our newborn screening, no additional samples. We start educating our families about this prenatally in the third trimester so that they hopefully have time to think about this and come by one by one, every single person at the bedside to make sure they have a chance to understand this, fully explore this and give them up to 30 days after the birth of the child to digest this and make an informed decision. As they do this, um, uh, as uh, we go through this, we again return all of the results. We've been doing this with personal phone calls uh, for negatives and then for positives, of course, bringing individuals in to do confirmatory testing covered by the study and being able to fully onboard those children because it doesn't stop with the diagnosis. We have to onboard them to care and oftentimes uh, be able to make sure in whatever language they speak and whatever insurance that they have, that they're getting the very best care. Um, what I'm proud to say is by that approach, which I think uh, really required a lot of time to think through, we have had an enrollment rate that's depending on our hospital, depending on the day, running between 70, 75 percent, which I think is about the right number. It's not 100 percent, nor did I ever expect it to be, um, but I think shows that we've gotten it mostly right. 
Um, within doing this, I'll say that we've been successful more than 99% of the time in terms of generating the sequence data. We've been bringing our turnaround time down as we've been doing this. And our positive screen rate, um, that is everyone who screened is not a true positive, but we're screening uh, approximately 4% of individuals as positives through this. Um, with this, we do have some false positives, but it is the minority. And so I think in terms of doing this, most of our results do end up being true positives. They end up being synergistic with traditional newborn screening. That is where I'm able to identify some of the false positive from metabolic screening, as well as even identifying some missed positives. Um, that is that there were false negatives from newborn screening that we've actually identified based on sequencing uh, or actually uh, were, were missed. Um, with this, we identify also new conditions, not surprisingly, uh, genetic causes of hearing loss, achondroplasia, but also some important things that we don't, we, we never have been screening for, things like long QT syndrome. Uh, in fact, with a de novo mutation, um, with a, a newborn that's uh, um, been seen on EKG to truly have long QT syndrome, and um, many of you will know this is the condition that can also result in sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and more commonly, that is the case, especially with de novo mutations in this gene. Um, we've had two cases of Wilson's disease that very easily is treated, we know, with zinc supplementation uh, to compete the, with the copper transport. Um, and one case we've recently had with uh, severe combined immunodeficiency that wasn't picked up on the SCID panel. So with this, um, just to say, though, we don't care just about newborns. Uh, we really care about people throughout the lifespan. And uh, although I won't spend too much time about it, in the eMERGE network, this NIH-funded study, really think about screening and pushing the envelope in a good way uh, by now thinking about how to integrate polygenic risk score across many conditions. Children and adults, individuals age 3 to 75, are included within this. Um, and for many of the common conditions and within eMERGE, we're identifying approximately 25% of individuals who are at increased risk, at least for adults who are at increased risk, for one or more of these conditions and currently studying, we don't have the answer yet uh, to know what they'll do with that information. And with this combining, for instance, monogenic risk, polygenic risk, and even in some cases, family history, as well as other risk factors to come up with a genomic integrated risk score, which is what I hope will be what we're increasingly doing in the future. So with that, uh, I'll just say that um, I've hoping, hopefully given you a bit of a potpourri in terms of what we're trying to do. It's a lot, um, but we're, we have the appetite to move the fields forward. We're far from finished, uh, but I do think in the next decade, we're entering in a very exciting era, hopefully giving you a tantalizing taste into diagnosis on scale, screening on scale, not leaving anyone behind, uh, doing this in a harder way, asking the tough questions, forcing us to do the tough experiments. Um, but as we're doing it also, and I want to underscore and emphasize this, getting to treatment. This is not just about diagnosis. This has to be about treatment, improving care, coming up with our guidelines, our best practices, and implementing all of that on scale as well. And I do truly in my heart of hearts believe that we can do this, and we can do this uh, with the challenges that we're presented with every single day, but we can do this, and, and I think increasingly uh, with many things changing and de-risking this, uh, I think many more treatments will be to come. So with this, I want to thank the, I would literally have hundreds of people here, so I apologize that I don't have everyone's name and pictures, but large groups of people in our large consortia, and uh, I will be coming uh, in uh, just a few days, actually, to the neighborhood, and for those of you in Boston, so here's my new email address for anyone who's looking to find me, um, and uh, as we're setting up our team, we'll also be having some new team members welcome that we hope to join us in Boston, so for any of you who are looking for jobs, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. So I'll be glad to stop the hearing, hopefully have time for questions. Um, Wendy, thank you so much for the fantastic talk. Um, so now we uh, open the session for questions. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand and uh, we'll unmute you and you can ask your question. The first question is with by Gallup. We cannot hear you, Gallup. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand, but thank you for the great, thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by uh, Patricia. Hi, Pat. I can't hear you yet, but 
For those of you who don't know, I think she's Hatta. unmuted. She she's muted. Pat, your bandwidth is making you sound wonky. <laughs> okay, we go to the next person. We are up. Oh, excellent. Thank you for your excellent talk. And I was thinking of the impact as you're uh, increasing your population, increasing the ethnicity, the interpretation of variants of a known significant that we are going to maybe overwhelm the <laughs> variants that are clearly pathogenic or uh, clearly benign. How do you think that uh, a population always screening can deal with that? Yeah. Uh, some of you know I'm a bit obsessed about variants of uncertain significance. So. Uh, I don't think we can avoid the problem. And I think this is for some of you that think about this, we need uh, just much, much larger reference data sets. And, and I have other efforts that I haven't talked about in terms of potentially hundreds of thousands uh, as we think about reference data, just to understand that. As you do that, there are, uh, our biggest, I would say, as a field are missense variants. We have the greatest difficulty in terms of understanding that. They're increasingly uh, with uh, alpha fold is just one way of being able to understand the three-dimensional structure of many proteins, not all yet, but many. Uh, one can use that, and I, and I don't mean to be cliche, but you can use machine learning and AI to be able to understand the distribution of those missense variants and with other prediction algorithms as well to do better. And I'll say that, um, Anyway, it's all about being able to have the data to power this and to be able to use the most of the data we have. That'll get us some of the way there. Within this, I do think we also need to think about in, in different circumstances, I think require different thresholds for what's returned. So I think of a diagnostic threshold as being different from a screening threshold because your priors are different, your Bayesian priors for the probability of having the diagnosis and your ability to make a match between a phenotype and a genotype are different if you have a newborn and you have no phenotype than if you have an individual with a very, very specific phenotype. And you can use that information on scale as well. It's about scalability again, to be able to think about the prior, uh, your Bayesian prior with this phenotype of this particular genotype. And so you can think about that probability that that in fact is not, uh, even though it might be a VUS by ACMG criteria, you know, really there's more, all VUs are not created equal. And so you can think about the VUs that are quantitatively leaning more towards likely pathogenic. And depending on what the circumstance is, I fully believe that we should be doing reanalysis. That is that there are certain times when you don't want to, in fact, I don't want to give a patient in a diagnostic setting, a long list of 52 VUs. That's, that's not helpful for most clinicians. On the other hand, if built into our paradigm is an iterative reanalysis and connectivity to be able to push out information as we better understand those variants and what actually is pathogenic, to me, that would be optimal and ideal in terms of supporting and having a commitment over time to patients, to providers. Um, I would love to see that ecosystem evolve. It's a complicated question in terms of who pays for that, how you support that financially, but I think scientifically and clinically, is the ecosystem, we as a community, where we're still building the plane as we're flying it. I think we have to admit that this is not fully baked or fully done. And in that, I think we have we need to have a different com commitment to our community, uh, to our patients than um, perhaps some other fields might. Thank you, um, thank you Wendy. Uh, I will be thankful if you ask, uh, if you start with your name and affiliation when you want to ask questions. Uh, the next question uh, uh, is by David Rosenblum. David. I'm trying to unmute. Hi, David Rosenblatt after uh, Miguel. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And, and, and the accumulation of these large cohorts is so important because as you know, genetics always trumps biochemistry. And the best way to prove the phenotype is to have multiple patients with the same uh, mutations. And um, I, I'm very impressed by the use of the whole genome sequencing as a screening module. So I'm just wondering, what is the price point we have to get down to to incorporate these into large scale programs and how 
close are we to that price point? Great question, David. Um, so I will admit we have gone ahead of ourselves uh, with, I, I like to, uh, you know, I'm kind of a Wayne Gretzky fan in terms of we've got to skate to where the puck was going to be. And so we started this out perhaps prematurely in terms of the pricing model, but knowing that by accumulate the time we accumulated the data, I'm going to put a number out there. We might be able to get down to genome sequencing for less than $100 per person, not just with data generation, but we've got to be analysis as well. Um, and so I'm going to, you know, put that stake in the sand uh, or, you know, plant that flag. Uh, I think if we can get there and, you, you know, you should, David, not just talk to me, but the public, I, I talk and work a lot with the public health community and newborn screening and understanding what we will have to do in multiple dimensions to achieve this. And I could spend a lot of time talking about this, but there's a lot we need to do to build the infrastructure. And so even though the marginal cost might be $100, <laughs> the fixed cost to get us up to that point to have the infrastructure is going to be significant. So we do have to think about the outcomes and how we're going to impact, how many lives we're going to affect, what the improvements are going to be, how that's going, what that's going to be in the long term. Uh, but I don't think we can shy away from it. I do think it's possible, but we need to collect the data to demonstrate what the impact is going to be because it's it, ultimately, I do think will be a public health issue and we'll have to think about society and um, ultimately people that will pay for this, all of the citizens. I'll also, uh, Robert reminded me that we have an ICONS meeting coming up in October for those of you who are interested in newborn screening and public health. And uh, that'll be a great opportunity to share learnings, not just from Guardian, but from all of us around the world. Thanks, Pat, Wendy. Uh, Patricia? I can't hear you though. Uh, I think we have a sound problem, uh, Patricio. We cannot hear you. Pat, I'm happy to follow up offline, but I just want to put a shout out. Pat is actually a collaborator on our CDH studies and has been a, a great partner and uh, will now be a closer friend across town at MGH. Um, okay, maybe we, we can go to the next person, Jillian. Hi, um, so my name is Jillian Kavanaugh. I'm a Boston-based NP. Um, I'm also the mom of a little girl, Ellie, that has Okra-Chong neurodevelopmental syndrome. Um, so obviously a huge fan of Dr. Chung. I just want to thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, my dear friend at Texas Children's was able to give me the link to do this chat. So um, I really appreciate it. And we're, we can't wait to see you at Boston Children's. Thanks, Jillian. Uh, thanks, Jillian. Uh, Dan? Hi, thank you very much for the talk. This is Dan Cohn from UCLA, and uh, um, congratulations on your new position. Uh, thanks, Dan. I, I'm just thinking, uh, this is a newborn screening program in which you're identifying variants or causal variants uh, in, in these newborns, um, many of which are, some of which are inherited. And in the context of um, adult onset diseases, uh, have implications for their parents who are now of reproductive age, but then will be, um, you know, aging into their disorders, so to speak, over time. And I'm wondering how you're acting on those variants, and whether this is uh, stirring in you the, the idea of population-based screening of adult, of non-newborns for these conditions. Yeah. Uh, Dan, I didn't have time to go into the details, but again, we're although we're doing whole genome sequencing, we're only looking at 238 genes, and the criteria for those genes are very early onset, pediatric onset, uh, in terms of treatments and, and uh, manifestation. So we're not, let me just be very explicit, we're not returning things like BRCA1 or 2, um, things that are adult onset that a parent might have. Um, I do, and, and I, again, it wasn't obvious, but I sequenced uh, Guardian and then Emerge to be able to bring up the point, though, that I really do believe in population-based screening for adults. Um, and in fact, uh, when parents ask about what can they do, we offer them Emerge as something that they can do, which is for them. It's built for them. It's tailored for them. Um, and it really is addressing their issues at their time in life rather than the issues we think about for newborns. And so I think there are different answers for different people along that life course. I, I'll just throw it out there. I can also imagine that um, 
this changes over a life course and there's different information you need over time and that there are ways of being able to recycle and reuse the information over time as either symptoms arise, manifestations arise, or as your age changes. Um, so I do hope we can also think about that in terms of value, even though it might start as a newborn, but value for life. Um, thanks, Wendy. Um, David? Hi, this is David Sweetser. Hi, Wendy. Thanks for a great talk. Hey, I'm looking forward to having you in town here. I'm, I'm David Sweetser at Boston, um, in Boston at Massachusetts General Hospital. I was just kind of thinking, you know, in your studies with autism, as you've mentioned, it's so extremely heterogeneous. Um, and the thought is just thinking back about a potential modifiable with risks and pathways and wondering if we can kind of learn from such a large body of data, um, whether there's anything that's more generalizable, you know, certain metabolic pathways is something that we could potentially modify on a, on a population-based scale like we did with folate and neural tube defects. You know, is there, are yeah. there any clues like um, neuroinflammatory pathways, something that would give a clue to why there's always that um, many times that abrupt regression yeah. at a certain period of time early in development? Yep. Um, so I'm happy to talk offline for anyone who's interested in spark or autism. It's so heterogeneous. Um, I didn't get too much into it. There's about 10% that have clearly mostly de novo, but monogenic events, they're, they're one set of people, right? And they do have some similarities in terms of gene families, transcription factors, histone modifiers, um, other things that are very foundational, both when, where they're expressed. And I think of them as sort of organizing features. Um, David, the things that, and those are, I think, tougher to modify. I think they can be modified. They can't be completely ameliorated. I'm gonna throw out there uh, something to think about within autism, which is that, again, if you can identify early individuals, not just with genomics, but also thinking about physiologically how behavior is manifesting, and you can think about things like eye tracking or EEG or other factors. And if early recognition of those individuals can help to be able to support those individuals who, whose brains might have patchiness in terms of strength or weakness or development, um, I think that's one group of individuals one might be able to influence. To your point about regression, they're a very important group, and I find it difficult to understand unless one looks prospectively exactly what that regression is and, and exactly what those factors are. They're a very severe group of individuals who are very precipitous. They fall off a cliff, and I would love to understand those individuals, David, and I really truly don't, and we don't have enough of them in Spark yet to be able to have those unifying features, but they're a group that pains me and pains their families enormously. Um, and so as scary as it is, and although I think Spark is large, it's not nearly large enough to be able to identify some of these groups that are very specific, and it doesn't have as many dimensions as I would like to have. Um, that is to be able to understand very, very early brain development in particular, where I think we have some opportunities. Um, and so, we're thinking about this. We're thinking about how to, to be able to address those issues and continue to expand the dimensionality of what Spark and other perhaps associated studies will do in the future. So great questions. Um, I have a question myself, Wendy. So uh, a few days ago, we discussed um, like the, uh, the uh, population genetic screening. And basically, the uh, I want to uh, hear your thought on how it's possible to enhance access to uh, the power of genomics and obviously genetic screening, specifically newborn uh, genetic screening, in uh, low and middle income countries. Most of the efforts have been focused on uh, basically the US and Europe and more resourceful countries. Uh, many other countries are now um, uh, coming into uh, the field of genetics and genomics. Um, um, we are uh, starting a collaboration, for example, with the Department of Health of Abu Dhabi, who is running like the, the Emirati Genome Program. But it's still, most of these efforts are focused on the countries with a lot of resources. Uh, how do you think we can take this, uh, these technologies and uh, the benefits of genomics to uh, low-income countries in Africa, um, uh, some, some countries in Asia and, and elsewhere? Yeah. Um... So great questions. I, I think there are several different stages when you think about this. So there's data collection. How do you do that at scale? What are the points that people enter the healthcare system and those nodes you can go through? 
um, how do you generate the data at scale? I do think you can have nodes to do that, um, centers essentially where you can do that on scale. Interpretation, the wonderful thing is you can be anywhere. And so collectively as a world community of genomicists, we can help in terms of doing that, but then you've gotta be local again. You've gotta be able to have someone to be able to a trusted person to understand the local constraints and the local implementation because diagnosis is just the very beginning. So how do you then uh, get the treatment available to those individuals at, at the cost we can afford to do uh, and to be able to do at scale and in a way that people will accept it. And that's one of the things I've learned from Guardian is also the acceptance and the key to trusted partners who are, they just become part of those families is the only way I know to say it in terms of really being able to help people on their journey. So with doing that, it's not easy. Um, I think for some of the populations that we're trying to serve, uh, one first step is that reference data I mentioned earlier. That is that when you have the reference data there, it becomes so much easier to do the interpretation um, and anyone to pitch in and to be experts. And I do think we have an international group of experts in genomics writ large doing this on scale. We also have subject matter experts, uh, and I've, I see several of them on the screen here. So that if you have a problem with one particular gene, we know who to call in terms of understanding that gene and making sure that we've got um, what may be in a community with a recessive condition, understanding whether that allele is really a pathogenic allele and even doing functional studies if we need to, because it'll be really important for that one community where we may see it very frequently and we may need to double down and put in some science behind that. So, you know, it's an iterative process that takes time, um, but we are so close to being able to start, and, and I say start, not finish, but to be able to start doing that at scale. And we need to we need to do it responsibly and iteratively. And if one does this and looks at your data and continues to learn and be able to improve, don't wait five years for your grant cycle, do it every single day. You can be flexible enough to get there. Thank you so much. Um, next question, Ben. Uh, thank you, I'm Bin Guan from the National Institute. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. My question is about the novel genes that you mentioned in the autism study. Have you attempted the gene disease association following clean gene SOPs? I'm, I'm sort of afraid that at least some genes would be with limited association. So what are you going to do with them? Yep. Um, so this is a great question, Ben. And uh, I briefly alluded to it, but didn't have time to get into it. So what I've personally done with many of those genes that would not meet ClinGen criteria, I actually spend quite a bit of time doing this for various different diseases. Uh, and in the early days, you will never be able to get you know, enough points to be able to show right. that association. But you can now start looking across conditions and realizing that many of those genes are not just autism genes. They really are genes that are syndromic is one of the terms we use, but that have other manifestations is the point. Um, you can now start to look and you can also uh, need to recall individuals. And so I think that's one of the keys to these longitudinal recontactable growing learning cohorts that we have is that you can recontact and call people back. And when you start to get to the specificity of everything from we talked about O'Kor Chung syndrome, but understanding specific facial features, specific structural things that are very specific. Sometimes it's biochemistry, sometimes it's functional studies in a fly, sometimes it's functional studies in a frog or a mouse, uh, sometimes it's biochemistry, but you build the evidence points that we need in terms of getting there. Um, and it won't happen instantaneously, but I can tell you, I think I have a pretty, pretty good nose for these. Um, I bat at least 80% in terms of these new genes at the end of the day being eventually disease genes that, that will meet ClinGen criteria. Um, the interesting thing is that once you start to see that, and this is on the diagnostic laboratory side, I do believe fully in publishing the information though, even before it's fully vetted as being truly disease associated, because a large source of that information is in the clinical diagnostic laboratories that don't feel confident enough to report those associations until they see some of the other data that are out there. And they don't always have time to look in every single cohort, even if we publish it in the supplementary tables. So um, I do think there are many genes that, uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna, this is not a dig, uh, but we need a better gene matcher than one little editorial comment out there. So if, if we could do that more efficiently, I think as a community, we'd actually do ourselves quite a service. Yeah, totally agree, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, Matt. 
Yeah. yeah. Hi, Wendy. This is Matt Sampson from Boston Children's Nephrology. Thanks so much for your talk and welcome to the neighborhood. Um, Thanks. My question is about genomic literacy and education for the pediatric pediatricians in general. You know, through your whirlwind tour of, uh, you know, your, your projects and accomplishments, it's clear that both common and rare genetic variation impacts rare uh, pediatric conditions as well as more common complex traits and diseases, and it spans specialties and general pediatrics. So from your perspective, from the perspective of genomic literacy, how do you think that we can bring to bear the benefits of genomic discovery to genomic medicine across our pediatric workforce so that, you know, we could all be in the best position to take advantage of these advances? So Matt, this is based on 25 years of trying one thing and at some point deciding uh, that we have to think about uh, the way, for instance, a pathologist or a radiologist would do this. And I'm not asking uh, myself to understand the physics behind an MRI. I'm able to be able to deliver a short, succinct uh, news you can use. And I think we've got to get there in terms of genomics. And we've got to do this uh, from, an, from an equity point of view. It can't depend on a pediatrician to refer a patient. I, I hate to say this. There are just too many gaps in our care. It just has to happen. And so that's why, in part, I've come to the realization in terms of Guardian. And when we deliver this, I can tell you uh, within Guardian, I don't do the handoff and say, here's a screen positive, you pediatrician now learn about this new rare condition that you've never heard about and figure out who to refer them to and do that. We take that burden on ourselves in terms of doing that, coming up with very simple act sheets. What do you as a pediatrician do? Boom, boom, boom. These are your three bullet points. This is your homework assignment. You don't have to go looking for the bit, you know, the or current up-to-date information. It's literally handing people who are incredibly busy, but who are trusted partners for that family. So I want to emphasize that again. General pediatricians, especially, or individuals, nurse practitioners, PAs, whoever it is, it's the individuals who know those families, know their local resources, know the constraints, know what's going to work and not work. That's what their secret power is. Our secret power on the genomic side is knowing who does tap on the shoulder, set up the infrastructure to do that, have those guidelines, build those guidelines, and make sure they get distributed. And bridging, you know, I think we haven't just had quite the right balance in terms of what's our role, what's their role. And I think we actually need to shift a little bit more in terms of making sure we as the specialists, let's do our job, but we, we need to disseminate that expertise. And so what are the channels, the communication channels to very, very widely disseminate that so that every one doesn't have to reinvent that wheel? I think if we can figure out, and I think we can, and so, you know, in a good or bad way, Epic is coming soon to children's. And so we're going to have that super highway of information coming soon to be able to help us with that dissemination. Thanks so much and see you soon. See you soon. Okay, uh, Wendy, thank you so much again. We are excited uh, about your move to Boston and looking forward um, to seeing you here. Um, so with this, I think um, um, uh, we, I just want to thank uh, Wendy again and uh, all of you. Um, uh, Wendy will be in Boston, as uh, she said, uh, she is hiring um, uh, team members. So feel free to, to write to Wendy if uh, you need um, um, her email address, uh, we can provide that as well. I think Yvonne can send it through chat as well. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to claim your uh, CME or, uh, or CE credits, um, uh, you can find uh, the information on this slide. You just need to text um, um, the word um, to uh, the phone number and follow the instruction. And with this, um, I thank you um, again and looking forward to seeing you um, at our next uh, lecture. Thank you.